Well, howdy, YouTube family. It is Bolt CRNA coming to you again with another day's topic. Today, we're getting into something about the negatives of being a CRNA. So I got hit up on Instagram and actually had someone who was trying to go to CRNA school ask me, hey, you talk a lot about the positives of being a CRNA. What's so great about being a CRNA? But you don't talk a lot about what you don't like about being a CRNA. So talk a little bit more, and they actually said, why don't you poll all the people on your Instagram, which I have a lot of CRNA followers and a lot of SRNA uh, anesthesia student followers. So I polled them, and today we're getting into a two-parter of what exactly is the worst aspects about being a CRNA. Let's get into it. There's a couple themes throughout here that I got sent that are pretty similar. So on those topics, I just combine those people's comments all into one. And there are other things that are actually pretty unique. So I was surprised some of these things I didn't even think about myself as not liking so much. But once they mentioned it, I thought, you know what, you're right. That's something that I deal with every day that actually stressful to me that I, I don't really consider being a downside, but it is a downside. So I'm including all of these things. None of these things come in any certain type of order. It doesn't go numerical of like the worst thing down to the not so worst thing or anything. These are kind of random. I tried to assimilate them all together so they had similar types of themes that were following along, but some of them are just a little bit random. So let's get into the first thing someone commented. Always having to explain to people that you aren't a doctor's assistant in the OR. That is true. Always is a little bit of a strong word to use, but I would say there is a decent amount of time or at least a feel, a feel of um, energy that you have to put into explaining to someone else who you are or what you do and also trying to clarify that what you don't do or what your role is not. Uh, because if you work in the wrong kind of practice, you might be in a uh, medical model or a culture in a hospital where a physician anesthesiologist takes is the point person or the lead person on everything and the CRNA may be like the considered like an assistant role or something and it's not truly how it's ever really practiced like that but it might be perceived like that to other people in healthcare and who may be on looking and not seeing what's going on behind the scenes they may just be seeing from a surface level and yeah that can get pretty exhausting i did a little per diem work in a hospital that was set up like that and had a medical culture like that and they did medical direction model there and in that model you do often feel like other people involved in the team think that you're assisting a physician anesthesiologist in providing the anesthetic which is totally false and, um, and yeah, it can just become draining, feeling like you're having to explain to people or justify who you are, what you're doing. That is definitely a con. And I, honestly, I just recommend not working in those environments. And, and thankfully, most of those kinds of cultures are dying out. There's a whole set of things that anesthesia, uh, nurse anesthesia residents commented that they dislike about their aspect of being uh, a CRNA student. And so it's kind of a unique thing to being in school. So I kind of lumped them all together as much as I could. So being an SRNA is pretty rough. And one thing that they said that they really dislike is having to do things everyone else's way. That's a very true aspect of training in anesthesia is there's a thousand different ways of doing anesthesia and you will find as a trainee, whether you're a physician anesthesiologist trainee or a nurse anesthesia resident, you will find out that Everyone will have a different way of wanting to do things. They will all want you to do it their way that day that you're with that person. And they will usually treat your way that you thought you would do as dangerous or negligent or ridiculous or something that's gonna make you feel bad about yourself essentially. It's rare to find CRNAs who are willing to train you and not treat you like you're an idiot for doing things the way their colleague who trained you yesterday told them to do it. Uh, and, and what's ridiculous about this is they were in training too and they remember that well. They know that there's multiple different ways to do things, but it's like as time goes on, they forget these things. Uh, I try and remember that thing and I don't 
judge anybody or any student when they come to me with a method, even if it's not my method or if it's a technique I don't prefer or I don't think is the best way, I'll explain to them, hey, this is the way that I do things. This is the way I prefer to do things. There are lots of ways you can do them. I understand you may do that in another room with another person, but let's try this method today. Or maybe I'll say do it the way you feel most comfortable doing it as long as I think it's safe. Another one that commented about being an anesthesia student is poor quality of life. Very accurate. In that sense, they mean um, like you just don't have much fun, like you're not doing much beyond just school, you know, studying, lecture, going to clinicals. That's not a high quality life, I would say. It's just basically you're grinding. Another person comments no social life, which is another element to that. Stress, yes, you're <clears throat> going to be under extreme stress as an anesthesia trainee. Learning anesthesia is very difficult and is very stressful. Uh, limited finances, that sucks about being in training. You, you're not getting paid. At least as a physician anesthesiologist trainee, as a resident, you get uh, subsidized by Medicare and Medicaid. They pay you a salary every year to be a resident. So you're at least getting paid. It's not much, but it's something. Uh, whereas in uh, CRNA school, you get paid literally nothing. You just pay them to, uh, you pay them quite a bit of money for tuition to train you and you get paid nothing. Um, another aspect that was mentioned is the toxicity of others' opinions. They're probably referencing how different people who are training you from day to day have different opinions on things and, and the way that they like things done and they can be kind of uh, assertive and sometimes toxic in the way that they present their thoughts and opinions to you as a trainee. Another one is just getting through CRNA school. They say that's the worst element of just being an SRNA, just trying to get through school. That's true. And then another student says, having physician anesthesia residents take the best cases. That can be accurate. If you're in a training hospital for physician uh, residents, you will find that oftentimes, I'll say that it's not all the time, but I'd say 70-30, they're going to get the best cases and you're going to get what's left over if you're in a hospital that trains them as well. That's why I did almost all of my training outside of hospitals that train physician anesthesia residents. I was lucky enough to even the academic hospitals and the bigger research type facilities we, we rotated in, they had other residencies, but they just didn't have anesthesia residencies for physicians. So, uh, so nurse anesthesia residents were their only trainees for anesthesia and we got all the best cases. So I was lucky enough and I would recommend looking into schools that do that. All right, back to the CRNA life and what is the cons of being a CRNA, not an SRNA. They're saying there is such variability to anesthesia practice, which is good for a CRNA, but very difficult when we were in training. Day to day, it can be like a roller coaster. And I had multiple CRNAs say that. So these are CRNAs remembering uh, back from training what, uh, what difficulties they had, learning multiple different ways of doing things. But even as a CRNA, um, you know, it can be stressful because you may be in a situation or a certain case and the surgeon may say, oh, why are you doing it this way? Or, oh, you know, they usually use an LMA for this. Uh, other, you know, people, other colleagues of yours use, uh, use an LMA for this case. Why don't you use an LMA? And you're thinking, because I'm not comfortable with you being in close to my airway and elbowing my airway, so I'm going to intubate. And so there's just lots of different ways people do things. You'll get comments on it, even as a CRNA sometimes. Ultimately, it's your choice as a CRNA what types of anesthetic methods you want to use as long as they make sense. Uh, but yeah, it is. It can be a little bit stressful. Another CRNA says, dealing with rude colleagues, you want to choke, but you just nod and smile. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, this also goes along with medical culture of a facility. If you're working in a tight-knit group of people who seem to really get along, Usually this is not a problem. Usually it's a, a pretty cohesive, uh, good environment. And we usually don't get too involved in each other's cases or what other people are doing so much. So it's not that big of an issue. But there are other types of medical models, especially like I mentioned earlier, medical direction, where your colleagues are maybe in the room for induction, which is the start of anesthesia, or they might be in the room for emergence, which is the wake up of anesthesia. Uh, they might be involved in your preoperative assessments or your blocks and all kinds of stuff. So at those times, in those kind of medical models, if you're practicing in that, you will have a lot of different interactions with different people on the team, and you may not agree with everything they say. And sometimes people can be 
rude and some people just don't have proper social skills to know how to interact with people on a respectful professional level and that uh, usually is learned and people usually are pretty good about it but you will have some in the bunch that just never seem to figure it out so they do become frustrating. Oh, this one is one that I did not really consider that much before CRNA school and really has irritated me as I've gotten older is waking up early. Yes, you will be waking up early. Some places very early, depending on how early the cases are starting. If you have to be at the hospital, changed out, scrubbed out, ready to go at 7 a.m., you got to get up at home a lot earlier than that, especially if you got like kids or a dog or something that you got to take care of before you go. Uh, for me, if I have to be at work at 7 a.m., and I don't live that far from work, but if I have to be at work at 7 a.m., I probably have to set my alarm for 5.30 in the morning. So that is stressful for me. And to think if I do that five days a week, five days in a row, it's, I don't know. Some people are morning people. I'm a morning person. I like to get up at, you know, 7 a.m. I usually get up at 7, 7.30, maybe 8 on my off days. But 5 a.m., that's too early. Anything before 6 a.m., I'm, I'm not happy. I'm getting up early every day. So, yeah, that does suck. Another guy says, unpredictable schedule while on call. Being on call is just something you don't really experience as a bedside nurse in the ICU. You don't quite understand what the life will be like. So when you graduate CRNA school and you're out there on your own just taking call, you realize how unpredictable the schedule can be when you're on call. Whether you're on call from home or you're on call in the facility, either way, you're essentially, you have nothing set up or designated for your day or even night. Usually it's night, overnight, until the next morning that you're on call. So you may have an emergency seven-year-old who swallowed a battery and it's gonna you know, explode in their stomach if you don't do a, you know, EGD of some sort and get it out. And you might be thinking this is dangerous and there's not many people around and you know, there's a lot of stuff that could go wrong here and you're just, you have to deal with it. Like it's your responsibility. That kid's life is in your, in your hands and you're expected to take care of it. And it's the same for a 90-year-old MI or something that's happening where you need to do like a major surgery on them. That can happen at two in the morning. You might be exhausted. Maybe you've not done that type of surgery in three years uh, and, and you're needing to jump on doing the anesthetic for it. There's lots of stuff that happens on call and you're just expected to handle it. It's very unpredictable. It can usually be very high risk, very stressful. Uh, not to mention you're not getting sleep. You're staying up all night and then you may have to revert back to day shift the following day and be there at 7 a.m. To, uh, to start your day shift schedule again. So yeah, being on call, not fun. Nobody likes doing it. The long hours. Um, yeah, I would say your hours can be pretty long. Anesthesia is not entirely um, schedulable. When people say shift, when they're like, I work a 10 hour shift or whatever, there's not really, most places don't have a true shift in anesthesia. You have a suggested time that you think that you're gonna be at the hospital for, but it may be longer than that. It might be less than that. Sometimes it's a little less than that if you're lucky, but a lot of times, you might say more often than not, it's gonna run longer than you think, especially if you're in a practice that does like a peel-off type schedule, which many practices do that, where a peel-off schedule is like, a three of you or so may be the late people for the day, which means you just stay until the rooms are finished and you don't know when you're gonna to get to go home. So you might think you're gonna leave at four o'clock that day, but if the cases keep running long, you stay till seven o'clock. You know, it, there's no way to guarantee the time you're getting out. So yeah, hours in anesthesia are always unpredictable, even in places that have a very structured schedule that some people will tell you like, oh yeah, I only work these set numbers of days. There will be times where they're gonna be asked to stay late. There will be times where their case does not finish on time and they're, they're asked like, hey, can you just finish your case? It's only got 30 or 45 minutes left rather than having someone else take over your case and then finish out your case and tie up a whole nother staff member. They're gonna ask you to stay late and finish that case. So you might stay 45 minutes, an hour later, every, uh, every occasional day or something, even in structured scheduled places. So yeah, your schedule in anesthesia is not gonna be like it was when you were doing bedside nursing and it was like 12 hour days, someone was there at 7 p.m. every night to take over your cases or your patients and you left. This one was commented multiple, multiple times. I lost track of how many times people commented this being one of the worst aspects of anesthesia school or anesthesia um, being a CRNA, uh, school debt. 
So when you get out of CRNA school, most people currently with the doctorate requirement like I had and, and people going forward will have, uh, they usually are like 200K in student loan debt. That's like the average that I seem to hear from most people from my generation going forward is about $200,000 in debt. And it's expensive. I mean, tuition's expensive. The fact that you can't work for multiple years, you know, that adds up to money that you're spending to just survive, that you're having to take out student loans to get by on. The student loan debt accumulates interest at a crazy rate. So most people, when they graduate CRNA school, the first multiple years, if they're responsible, maybe three to five years, but if they're not very responsible with their finances, maybe many, many years, the, the, those set of years is usually got a heavy focus on paying off student loans, paying off student loans. You hear that all the time from CRNAs who are like in my condition, like in the first few years of their practice, you always hear them talking about like, I'm working more to try and pay off student loans. I'm picking up an extra per diem position to pay off student loans. I, I'm saving money and I can't buy that car that I want right now because I'm paying off student loans. I want to buy a house, but I really need to pay off my student loans first. It's always a focus. So yeah, it's, it's a stress. It, it is it can be done if you're responsible with your money so don't think that you know your student loan debt is something that should deter you from going to crna school because you make plenty of money when you get out you can pay them off but it's just a big mountain to climb uh politics about using our doctoral title so this is also coming from this, the newer generation of crnas like myself who all have doctorates so we're the first generation who are coming forward who have our doctoral educations as crnas and the politics and anesthesia are already so volatile and so intense when you throw on a doctoral title with your education uh, as a nurse anesthesia provider it really gets heated so yeah there's a lot of weird vibes about it people um, can get very aggressive and very insecure when you when they find out you have your doctorate and sometimes they could just get downright unprofessional in the workplace and make little comments and stuff that's just not necessary and they would never make to other doctoral holding um, healthcare professionals it's just ridiculous sometimes what what you deal with it's not all the time uh, and I managed to avoid most of those conversations altogether. But yeah, that is a downside. And that will change as time goes on, as you know, people get more familiar and, and people get used to it. And it's not a new thing anymore. I don't think that that's going to be something that we're going to be dealing with as much. That's going to be as big of a problem. But yeah, for now, it is kind of a minefield dealing with that. Uh, they say your family members never seem to get it. And by get it, I'm sure they mean like understand what you do and what you are. And you're you're not a physician anesthesiologist, you're a nurse anesthesiologist, but what does that mean? And is that the same as a CRNA? And what is a CRNA? And you tell them what a CRNA is and they, they hear certified registered nurse anesthetist and they can't say anesthetist and they don't know what anesthetist means. And they think that it means you give facials or inject Botox, which is an esthetician. Um, there's just all kinds of weird stuff that goes on with trying to explain to family members and even just the general public what anesthetist even means or how they can even say it. Um, so yeah, there's just a lot of discussion that goes on educating people who you are and what you do and that is annoying. No set schedule between add-ons, call, and they say outsiders don't understand. Exactly, that's kind of what I was explaining earlier with the schedule, where you really, even in places that have a set schedule, it's, it's pretty unusual to find someone who actually literally only works the time that they think they're gonna be there to the time they think they're leaving every day all consistently. There's just, there's add-ons, there's emergency stuff that happens. As an anesthesia provider, your, your, your role is not totally predictable. It coincides with surgery. Surgery can't be entirely predictable, even in times where you think it should be. So yeah, your schedule is just going to be unpredictable, especially with call. And yeah, most of my friends and family and stuff, they just don't get it. They'll say, hey, can we meet up after you, you're supposed to get off work around three on Friday. Let's all meet up at five or six and go do something. And you make plans to do that. But turns out your cases run long. There's something that happens. Um, you know, you end up not leaving work till 5.30 or something and you're wore out and you can't go and they're like, what's the matter with you? You know, you, you bail on us all the time. The reality is my schedule is just not predictable. I can't always guarantee that I'm going to be able to make stuff. Another person says being on call, which we've mentioned. So that's multiple times people have mentioned call and schedule. So in case you haven't figured it out, our schedule can sometimes suck 
and that isn't that isn't something that you can really change very much about anesthesia. There's some little ways to do it, but in general, most of us will say that your your role has an unpredictable schedule. Lack of hydration and potty breaks. Tell me about it. You cannot have any liquids in the OR. You can't have liquids anywhere in the vicinity of the OR. There's like red lines outside the out, uh, outer layers of surgery before you even get to the hallways that go to the OR rooms. Anything past there, you're not bringing drinks, you're not bringing anything back there. You have to be in a certain hospital scrubs, scrubbed out into those scrubs instead. They're very restrictive on what's allowed back there. Food, drink, none of that stuff, and you're gonna spend 85% of your day in those areas that don't allow anything else. So unless you're being given a break, uh, you're not getting to go to the bathroom, you're not getting to eat anything, you're not getting to drink water. It's not like when you did ICU nursing and you could walk out of your patient's room and run by the nurse's station real quick and swig some water and then take off again to your other patient or something. You can't do that in anesthesia. You can never leave the patient, though you have to stay with the patient unless someone else who's an anesthesia provider comes to relieve you, so then you can leave. And even when you leave, it's not right around the corner. You're gonna go like down a long hallway. It's gonna take you a minute to get somewhere where you could have stored water to drink it. So yeah, it can be, it can be a problem sometimes. I drink a lot less water than I'd like to. And I use the bathroom a lot less than I'd like to too. And lastly for this video, uh, multiple people said taxes. I, my, one of my last videos that I posted, I think a week ago, was talking about the taxes, where I, where I display exactly how much I paid last year in taxes. It's astronomical, it's ridiculous. Uh, your taxes, after you get into a certain tax bracket, is crazy if you're not married with kids and stuff and working as a CRNA with a fairly, uh, what's considered a higher above average income, you will pay a wild amount in taxes, especially if you live in a place like California that already taxes people pretty highly anyway. Well, all right guys, those were the initial things that people told me that were some of the worst aspects, the cons of being a CRNA. I wanna hear from you guys down below what your cons are. If you're a CRNA or you're a CRNA in training in school, what's the worst aspects about it to you and do you disagree with something that they've said do you think that call is not so bad and you like taking call there are some people who pick up extra call shifts you know god bless you for doing that i don't like it i don't do that but some people do so i want to hear from you guys down below before i go any farther i want to shout out the ketamine kings it is that time of the month to shout out the number one top members on my channel you guys make this happen, all the members make this happen, but part of the membership tier perk benefit of Ketamine Kings is that I shout you guys out once a month in one of my videos. So today, that's what we're doing. Thank you so much, Dan Angelo De La Cruz. Thank you, Samantha Prather, Taji Dixon, Thomas Alberti, John Pender, Talia RL, Geet Athwal, Seben George, Lindsey Grieve, Kendall Martin, Cynthia Almonte, Zara Rashid, That Africa Nurse, Spider Taco, Jody Shepard, Mackenzie Cooper, Mick Ellis, Nathan Drakes, and no, that's not from the Uncharted video game because I asked him, uh, Sonny Kwan, Paul Gonzalez, Garrett Case, Ty Sweeney, Matthew Welters, and Anonymous. Thank you, you guys, you're rock stars. Thank you for helping support this channel and helping me continue to do all this. So of course, if you wanna join the membership, go over there and click the membership tab and hit join. Hit the subscribe button, hit that like button, guys. It's so easy and simple and helps this channel out. It's the algorithm on YouTube. It's suggested to other people if you hit the like button, so please do it for me. And until next week's video where we get into the second part of this, that's Bolt Out.